Good evening. My name is Michiel Borstad. Welcome, everybody. It's a big honor to be here and to be at the stage of Dr. Paul, who's a hero himself, a scientist, entrepreneur, and we share the love for music, the love for the piano. Dr. Paul was a very fine pianist. And today we make music for him. I play for you, but I have one of the best singers waiting to play for you, to sing for you. She was a the competitor for the Netherlands at the Eurovision Song Contest twice. First time in 1998 and the second time in 2007. She is the Lady of Soul, the Lady in White. Here she is, Miss Etzilia Rombly. It's great to be here, I must say. I hope you all will enjoy the evening, or afternoon, or morning. I mean, everywhere. It can be any time. So I just want you all to relax and also enjoy this evening, but especially to go home and dream of making this world a better place. And the person that does that a lot is a beautiful lady, and she's going to be your host today. She writes, she presents. I want everybody to give her a warm welcome. Please, everybody, give it up for Sabina De Foss. Woo! <laughs> Thank you. Wow. What a great welcome. Thank you, it's Idiel Bromsley. Thank you for the wonderful music. And if you think, oh, what a shame. We only heard like one minute of that beautiful song. No panic, Adelia will be back at the end of this ceremony to play the complete My Old Piano song. So ladies and gentlemen, a very, very, very warm welcome, a very good evening, or as Adelia said, good morning, good afternoon, because we have people watching online on Facebook and YouTube, so they could be watching from wherever. But especially a very warm welcome to everybody here with us tonight in this Janssen compound that would not have been here if it were not for one person. One person can actually change the world, like Dr. Paul Janssen did. He didn't like people to call him Dr. Paul Janssen. Everybody seemed to have known him as just Dr. Paul. He didn't mind much on hierarchy. He liked more horizontal structures, people working together as a team. And as a team, they have accomplished a lot. Here in Bierse only, 4,000 people work. And that's all thanks to Dr. Paul Janssen. So we are very honored to have his uh, wife here, Mrs. Dora Janssen. A very warm welcome to you. And I guess a lot of people from the Janssen family, because you had five children together, am I correct? And a lot of grandchildren, yes. And of course, a very warm welcome also to our two winners, our two award winners of this Paul Janssen Award for Biochemistry. We will see them a lot more tonight, but I already want to say we're very happy and delighted to have you with us, Dr. Uh, Ulrich uh, Hartl from the Max Planck Institute in Germany, and uh, Dr. Arthur Horwich of the Yale University, the School of Medicine. Thank you so much, and already congratulations a little bit. We also have a large division people of Johnson & Johnson, our American family, who uh, were able to join us tonight for this ceremony. Tonight is all gonna be about science. Without science, nothing 
ever happens. There wouldn't be life, nothing would change in life. People would still die of futile diseases. So we absolutely need scientists and we need prizes like these to help scientists to do their job. And we have been given this prize for the 13th time this year. And we're going to hear a lot about proteins, but it's not all going to be on uh, difficult words tonight, on the contrary. By the way, I'm very honored that I have been asked to be your host tonight, because Janssen and I, we share values. I have been the voluntary ambassador for Kunina, which is an NGO not very far from here, in Giel, in Belgium. And we have been helping for 30 years children to get a diploma, to be able to go to school. And we have done that also together with the Janssen family a couple of years ago. So we share the values of making this place a better world, as Adzilia said. And also, I happen to be in love with a neurosurgeon. So we are currently writing a book on the functioning of the brain for a very broad public. So the content of tonight's award is very special to me as well. So ladies and gentlemen, let make, let's make tonight a celebration, not a very strict ceremony. Let's celebrate science and everybody who contributes to make science possible. And what a better way to celebrate the champions of science by inviting my very first two guests to the stage. I would like to welcome Dr. Paul Stoffels, Belgian Paul Stoffels, Vice Chairman of the Executive and Chief Scientific Officer of Johnson & Johnson. And he will be joining Mrs. Seema Kumar, the Vice President, Innovation, Global Health and Science Policy Communication, also of Johnson & Johnson. Dr. Stoffels, Mrs. Kumar, please join me on the stage. Thank you. I hope we are not supposed to dance now. Hmm? We can. But, uh, <laughs> uh, first of all, uh, um, a welcome to everyone, Janssen, uh, our, ex our external guests. Thank you for coming on this rainy day here. Uh, Madame Janssen, Ajit, Minnesota, uh, um, Steph, uh, and Stefan Reet, thank you. Yeah. Um, all welcome, uh, the previous CEOs of and the current CEO of, Jan of the Janssen campus. Very welcome uh, to this great event now for the 13th. 13th year. 13th. Yes, indeed. So. Yes. And uh, let me uh, echo that. And on behalf of Johnson & Johnson, let me say a very warm welcome to all of you. Uh, here we are once again in my favorite place, which is the home of Dr. Paul in this beautiful research campus. And so it's lovely to host all of you here and uh, for a very, very special, special, special evening. So, Paul, um, I think it was about 15 years ago in 2004 you and I were part of a team that was working between 2004 and 2006 on how to honor the legacy of Dr. Paul. And we came up with one way to honor him, and that was the Paul Janssen Award for Biomedical Research, which we established and announced in 2004, and the first one was given out in 2006. But really, let's circle back to Dr. Paul and his legacy, because really what we are here to do is to honor his legacy. You, of course, were a student uh, and a mentee of Dr. Paul. Talk a little bit about him and his well, legacy. Yeah. Um, Dr. Paul was a single focused scientist physician with a single focus on how can I make patients better? and uh, bringing the best science with a real focus on making impact on health was the DNA and is still the DNA today of the company. And today still we continue that DNA where we, con where we connect the best science with, with significant impact uh, on patients. And we still build on that legacy, um, with in the, especially in the mental health franchise, in, in the HIV. Y this year we had another big... Uh, uh, win with uh, once every second month HIV injection. The last drug of Dr. Paul, which we have been working on for now more than 20 years, and it had another big win, now six injections a year. So we continue to be entrepreneurial, connect the science, and make a difference for patients in all of our organization. And that has made us from a small company. Today, we are the number one pharmaceutical company in innovation in the US and we have become the number three in the world. And it's all based on one thing, 
focusing on the patient and making the difference for life. Yeah, and of course, you know, the work in the Janssen pharmaceutical companies of Johnson & Johnson was just extraordinary that Johnson & Johnson has named its entire pharmaceutical enterprise Janssen, right? I mean, that was the ori origin, but it's now become like the biggest legacy ever. All the work that's going on by scientists here and around the world under the Janssen name, is it not? And give us a couple of examples. Well, having the name of Dr. Janssen was having a soul in the organization, a real soul organization, which is all about people. And it are people working for people. It are scientists working for patients. And that's that real soul, heart and soul in an organization, is what makes the organization work. Yeah? And we also always say in the business, it's very challenging to say to people, bring your heart and your soul to the company. But in Janssen, that's the possibility. People can work on what they like, what they focus, they can choose their focus, they can be part of teams who for 5, 10, 15, 20 years sometimes work on new applications, new drugs, new, new science, and many of those come to fruition after a very long time. But that's the heart and the soul of the organization. Don't give up, work hard, one focus, and make the difference. So talk about a couple of examples, though. I want to press you on that. So let's take HIV or TB. Talk about the work that's going on in TB, for example, and in HIV. Well, still uh, from the old days uh, to now, we, uh, we have been working on HIV. And I told you a few times about that the first real studies we did was 16 pills twice a day. Today, and that was like 20 years ago, people survive. Today, we are one pill once a day. Now, we are one injection once a, month, once a month, one injection once every second month, so six injections a year. And now, we are working on an HIV vaccine. So the science we started back in the 90s is still yielding a lot of great, uh, great new products today. And that, that's a great business. And also, that allows us to reinvest. The TB uh, started uh, so long ago, and I think it took us almost 20 years to do it. But what was amazing in this year was we treated probably the first 150,000 people uh, over the last two to three years with a mortality reduction from 80 to 20 percent in XDR TB. A real breakthrough. And we discussed earlier with the winners, the target is quite exceptional. The ATP synthase, uh, nobody ever would talk we could do that. In, in mental health, we built on, on the legacy of Dr. Paul with the Haldol, Haldol, Haldol-Piridol, uh, and then the long actings. We were now on once every three months, and we are now studying once every six months. So two injections for schizophrenia a year. And on top of that, we are now building this also out in Africa for people who have absolutely no access to healthcare. We started a program in Rwanda for mental health with very nice results also there. So just a few examples. One more. Yeah, yeah. Balversa. Um, Balversa. I uh, this year we got the drug approved uh, for bladder cancer, and it originated here in the labs. Uh, we worked again, almost 20 years on it, but it yielded a fantastic new medicine for bladder cancer, which now will be uh, can, a, a drug which also can be used broader. So we are going to do many more studies and many more indications. So first targeted therapy for cancer we did. And this is a beautiful, uh, beautiful example how uh, a campus like this continues to live and delivers year after year after year. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's interesting because I'm thinking back to you and uh, Jacques. You know, you came up with Janssen 2020, a vision to really focus on transformational medical innovation. And that's what we focused on. And the transformational medical innovation is also what has signified all of our winners, 18 winners to date, who have won the Paul Janssen Award, three of whom have gone on to win the Nobel Prize. And actually, Dr. Hartle and Horwitz just two weeks ago won the Breakthrough Prize after winning the Paul Janssen Award, correct? Mm -hmm. And so it's, uh, it's just, yes. Mm -hmm. So it's almost as though the Paul Janssen Award has become a bellwether for transformational medical innovation, if I may say so. And uh, the work that has been done is just extraordinary. I mean, do you remember some of those, you know, well, um, pieces? Each of the winner had, had was the winner for his own reasons, yes. and uh, always a breakthrough. Three of them went on to the Nobel Prize. You remember uh, Craig Mello with RNAi, mm -hmm. then um, 
Ushumi with autophagy, autophagy and yeah. then immune uh, immune oncology uh, with um, Jim Allison. Jim just Allison, yes. yes, just last year. Uh, just yeah. last year, all these all these platforms, which now uh, before they were far away for us, very complicated, difficult to tackle. Today they become part of our everyday life. We have now drugs with RNA. We have we are on cell therapy. CRISPR Cas9. If you remember the yep. ladies who were here, yep. who, uh, Emmanuel Charpentier and Jennifer Doudna, yes. one for CRISPR Cas9 Cascade. Yes. Yeah. Those those now those technologies are now part of our organization. We started our first uh, cell therapy now um, in 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 oncology um, with uh, with CAR T mm -hmm. uh, and accelerating very fast. So uh, not impossible in the next two years, we have cell therapy, uh, we'll have all these different platforms in the company. And that has also, it's also in the DNA of, of, of Janssen, is changing and moving on to those things which really can make a, different, a difference for, for patients. You need terrific, incredible scientists for that because from gene therapy, cell therapy, all the different antibodies we do today, we still do the small molecules very, very well. All these platforms are now part of our portfolio. And that gives us the ability. I think we did about 25 medicines in the last 10 years, yep. uh, about one, two, so, sometimes three a year. And that comes to the combination of the passion of the people, the access to new science, and the availability of the platforms. Now, also including vaccines. Vaccines, yes. So I said we're sort of maybe the bellwethers for success. And how is it possible that we can select the winners? Is it luck? Or do we have a crystal ball to know who is going to succeed? No, no, I think it comes because we have an extraordinary selection committee. The selection committee is composed of leading scientists from all over the world, including Nobel laureates. And one of our newest selection committee members, Dr. Cato Lorenzen, is here with us today. Thank you for joining us, Cato. Really happy that you could make it here. And we'll hear from Cato in a little bit. Um, and so our extraordinary selection committee really works very hard to, and it's a very rigorous, rigorous committee because we get multiple nominations and it's a very rigorous process. And this year, of course, the committee unanimously chose uh, the two of you. And so congratulations again. So that is, is you know, this is a Paul Janssen Award and we recognize so many scientists, but at the end of the day, transformational innovation is not about innovation alone, correct? It's uh, because we want to make a difference in the trajectory of health for humanity. So how do you measure success? Well, we measure, I measure su success in years of life, in years of quality of life. That is the biggest driver for the success of our business. If we select if, for our work, if we select new areas to go to, it has to be areas where there is a big medical need and where we, with our capabilities, uh, is, can do something and something impactful. We have left behind everything which is not differentiated, which that means where there is no real clinical differentiation for patients, we don't spend our time on, because that will be solved by others. We try to shift forward all the time into, into problem solving for, uh, for significant uh, diseases. And that's, uh, again, the DNA, which was there from the 50s in the company, it uh, survives still and don't, uh, don't go any challenging out of the way. If there is a new disease, we go after it. Mm -hmm. And it all comes from breakthrough science at the end of the day. And uh, today we are honoring the work of uh, the winners of our 2019 Dr. Paul Janssen Award for Biomedical Research for your work, Dr. Horowitz and Dr. Hartle, uh, on the work of cha chaperone-mediated protein folding. And protein folding is important because misfolded proteins can lead to devastating diseases like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's and cystic fibrosis. So understanding the molecular mechanisms underlying protein folding uh, is just extraordinary, the work that you have done. And this is part of our Champions of Science legacy, where we champion science, recognize scientists like you, recognize scientists all over the world, and inspire young, the next generation of scientists to come into scientific fields. And so we have multiple champions of science uh, all over the world. And so, Paul, I give you the last word. Well, I want to remarks. congratulate uh, 
th the winners of this year because of their amazing work. I also want to thank you for the exceptional engagement today with our talent in, in, the, in, in, in the research labs this morning. The young talent were even students from outside. So it was a fantastic day for everybody who could participate. Also a big learning for everyone involved. But especially I want to thank you for the fun putting down the fundamentals of this protein folding challenge because it gives the insights for the next generation of very significant medicines which can be built on what you have uh, laid out in, uh, and unraveled in science over, uh, unfolded in science over so many different years. So we'll hear later from the two gentlemen on how, we, uh, how they did that. Yes, and before we step off the stage, science can sometimes be very, very complex and explaining it and making it simple, relevant, human can be very difficult. But one way we can do that is actually through music. And so what we're going to hear now is a musical interlude. And with that, we can step off the stage. Thank you. <clears throat> Music speaks louder than words It's the only thing that the whole world listens to Music speaks louder than words When we sing, people understand Sometimes the love you feel inside Get lost between your heart and your mind And words aren't really saying the things You wanted them to But then you hear in someone's song What you've been trying to say all along and somehow the magic of music, the message come true. Music speaks louder than words. It's the only thing that the whole world listens to. Music speaks louder than words when we sing. The longer I live, the more I find That people never take the time To really get to know a stranger And make him your friend But the power of a simple song Singing and playing can get us back together again. Music speaks louder than words. It's the only thing that the whole world listens to. Music speaks louder than words when we sing. speaks louder than words it's the only thing that the whole world listens to music speaks louder than words when we sing people understand okay now i need your help It's the whole wide world that everyone listens to. Music speaks louder than words. When we sing, people understand. One more time. Music speaks louder than words. It's the only thing that the whole world listens to. Music speaks louder.
Thank you, Zilia. It's so nice to see someone enjoying what they're doing, isn't it, ladies and gentlemen? Thank you, too. <laughs> Beautiful song, and it's true. Music speaks louder than words, and music is a language that we all understand. It's about emotions. And science, for non-scientists, sometimes may sound not so emotional, which is so not true. But understanding science for non-scientists is hard, because we are not all devoted to cells and the functioning of cells and molecules and how that all functions and works and how that affects our life. Luckily, our two award winners are and have been their whole life. And as we heard from Mrs. Kumar and uh, Dr. Stoffels, whom I wish to thank for their very interesting talk we just had, science is, can be really complicated to understand and it can take 20 to 30 to even more years to get somewhere, to find something. And if you look at the award, it represents Dr. Paul in two ways, but also it represents science because here at the back you have glass. You can see through glass. There's no end to what we can achieve if we keep on funding science, if we keep on helping people like you find things that can cure people that are still dying today of the diseases they shouldn't die of. So that's the glass. But you need in those 20 or 30 or 40 years or however long it takes, one moment to like an aha erlebnis, a eureka moment that you say, that's, that's the latest, the last drop I needed to finally see it. I found it. That's the moment. That's the drop. That's what it signifies. And you have discovered something that for the scientific world was hard to believe because all the biology books had been saying it differently for decades. So thanks to you, all the biology books worldwide had to be changed. So, <laughs> thank you for that. <laughs> but I think it's still quite hard to understand for non-scientists what exactly you have uh, discovered about the folding of proteins in a cell. So I suggest we look together, guided by some beautiful music, at a beautiful animation made by the Max Planck uh, Institute in Germany, where one of our award winners is the director of. Please join me in watching a beautiful and very hopefully clear animation on protein folding. Cells are the basis of life. Their machinery of proteins make our body function well. But proteins only work if they are folded in the right three-dimensional structure. Proteins that are not neatly folded can be harmful or cause diseases such as Alzheimer's and Huntington's disease. A restlessly winding protein chain is looking for the best way to fold itself. It looks like a chaotic and unclear process. Due to the tiny molecular level on which it all happens, you can hardly follow the process. But a correct folding is essential for the functioning of the protein. Incorrect folding can cause protein clumps that are harmful to the cell. Protein folding goes wrong more often than good. Only 30% of the protein chains achieve the good 3D structure in one go. To be able to do their work in the cell, proteins need help from other proteins, the so-called chaperones. Chaperone proteins are crucial in the cell's protein factory. 
They protect newly formed proteins against all kinds of dangers in the cell and push them into the right configurations with gentle force. They seem to make the search process for the best form more efficient. Chaperones proteins ensure that nothing goes wrong in all sorts of ways. Newly formed proteins are taken to the chaperone room. Here they have the right environment to fold undisturbed. And then the lid is put on. The protein is functional if folding was successful. Now it can leave the chaperone room and take on its correct role in the cell. As we get older, the ability to produce extra chaperones decreases and cells become vulnerable. Misfolded proteins and the clumping of misfolded proteins in the cell cause protein folding diseases such as Alzheimer's, Parkinson's and Huntington's disease because they poison our bodies. The evolution has simply not designed a system to increase the amount of chaperones when we age. An applause I take for the animators of the Max Planck Institute who made this wonderful animation that hopefully was completely correct, which we will hear in a second. Otherwise, don't blame me. <laughs> but as you can understand, uh, especially the scientists among you, um, that was a quite shocking discovery you did. It really shook up the whole world of science. So I think it's about time we give the stage to our two award winners of tonight and uh, crossfire them on protein folding. Please, a very warm welcome on the stage for our two award winners, <laughs> Dr. Hartl of the Max Planck Institute in Germany, of which, please take a seat here, he is the director, and Dr. Horwich of the Yale School of Medicine. Gentlemen, doctors, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. How are you feeling? Very good. Yeah. Thanks to you. <laughs> oh, thanks to me. Oh, that's gentle. Thank you. Let's have a drink later on. <laughs> How about you? Excellent. Yes? Nice day. <laughs> um, you have won I've read your biographies, of course. You, both of you have won so many awards. You have gotten so many honors. What makes this Paul Janssen Award for Biochemistry special? In what way is this a special one for you? Except that maybe afterwards you win a Nobel Prize, of course. Well, it's, it's a very special award because it's named after Dr. Paul, who was such an inspiring scientist, and uh, we have admired him for many years. And uh, to be part of this, to honor Paul, Dr. Paul, is, is really a great privilege. Mm -hmm. What about you? I think that holds for me. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> also, I think we revere the colleagues um, that we know on the uh, awards committee for recognizing us. Um, and I think we're especially honored to be here today and get to see the Janssen operation close up. That was a thrill. 
for them as well, as we heard. Oh, so, <laughs> that's very kind. Um, what I don't quite understand, if I'm right, you already made the discovery in the, the 90s of the last century. That's like 30 years ago. What, wh how come you're sitting here now? I think that there was a lot of skepticism about it <laughs> in the initial going. And then I think once people recognized what it might be, they wanted to know how it worked. <laughs> and we weren't so fast to figure all of that out. It did take us 20 odd years. Yeah. Um, why your interest in this particular subject? What was the trigger for the both of you to start investigating exactly there this topic? Many circumstances that were responsible for that, things that we did only influence to some extent. I mean, where we worked at the time, the problem that we worked on, I worked on a problem that was related to protein folding. Uh, it had to do with the way cells make certain organelles, the mitochondria, these are little uh, cells within the cells, if you will, that are required for energy production. And they have to take up proteins from the rest of the cell, and we realized that this involves uh, mechanisms that are relevant for the folding problem and offered opportunities to study how a protein would yeah, Because fold. before your discovery, the whole world was convinced that the folding just went automatically. Yes. How, how did you come up with the idea that maybe it wasn't? Who of you really did the discovery? <laughs> <laughs> I think it was pretty mutual. <laughs> we were both pointing in the same direction. Yeah. I mean, we... Separately, uh, or were you really working on well, it for together? Well, me, for me, I'd come from a sort of medical bedside vantage point of looking at um, children with a terrible metabolic disorder that was lethal as newborn. Um, and that led to a mitochondrial protein. And we wanted to understand more about how mitochondrial... Not only this protein, but more generally, how mitochondrial proteins um, are generated how they're imported into those little organelles and what happens. And um, I think one thing led to another. <laughs> mm -hmm. And at what point did you realize, wow, this could be a major breakthrough for very yeah, diseases like Huntington, Parkinson's, uh, to I, name a few? I think that, that realization came a lot later. But maybe within the first two years or so of working together, we, we did realize that we might have discovered something that could have uh, a paradigm shifting effect uh, on the field. But then as Art said, there was a lot of skepticism and uh, we were wondering how could we convince our colleagues that this was really true. So a lot more work had to be invested to find out how it really works and in which other systems would it be, uh, would it hold true more generally. And then later on it became clear that as you pointed out, when proteins misfold, that this is the cause of uh, numerous diseases. And then, of course, the connection was very clear that this machinery would have to be necessary to prevent that from happening. Mm -hmm. And once you make the discovery, then what? You, you, you make the world known. Um, what do you expect well, I think, I think to, to happen? Well, I think to begin with, we, we were just scared of... Uh, being wrong and um, anxious to just understand this basic process. So uh, in cells, there's a sort of transfer of information between DNA, which encodes all our proteins, and the proteins that are sort of the workhorses in the cell. And here suddenly we're sort of thrust into looking at the last step of information transfer. We dared not make an error. <laughs> so we spent a lot of time working on the basic process. And I think that may be true um, more generally that scientists, un many scientists who work on basic life processes uncover something, and only later does it become clear exactly that this relates to something in the human uh, disease or well-being sphere. Um, and actually, there's sort of a parallel universe of neuroscientists and neurobiologists who, while we were working out this basic mechanism, were showing that the aggregation is a very prominent feature of neurodegeneration. So the two fields were sort of going along in parallel and have now become pretty strongly mm -hmm. un, uh, joined. Mm -hmm. Because like Parkinson's disease, Huntington's disease, up until now, or I must be mistaken, there's no real cure. There's no real cure. No. Can, can what you have discovered lead to a cure? Well, that we do hope that it will at least advance 
ways to think about cures and, and develop new therapeutic strategies. I would like to pick up on something that Art said. I mean, at the time when we discovered these things, we had no idea about the medical implication. It was just a curiosity-driven basic research. And if it ever becomes relevant for curing a patient, then it really demonstrates that, that we should invest perhaps even more in supporting basic research. Uh, we hope that we will be understanding more and more details of how cells normally avoid the formation of these misfolded protein clumps mm -hmm. that perhaps can utilize the cell's own defenses to treat some of these diseases or prevent them or delay them. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe that will be something for future generations. Uh, on the Paul uh, Janssen Award dot com yeah. website, there's a little film with uh, the both uh, of you, where one of you says, and I like that in the end, um, that now it's for the next generation. It could be. I mean, but I, I think there are, there's quite a cohort of people working yeah. on these things, so I think the hope is sooner than later. Yeah. We can have it. It would, yeah. it would be nice if we could benefit from it ourselves. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, because science for non-scientists, it, it looks like a very sturdy business where you're very uh, serious the whole day. But apparently that's not the case, I heard. In labs, it can be yeah. fun to work. Yes. Of course. Yeah. I can, I can no, we have to encourage young people to become scientists, right? Yeah. So sure. <laughs> here's your chance. It's very yeah. exciting to work in a lab. and uh, I mean, there's, there were little other jobs or professions where you can really still discover something. And uh, I think yeah. this excitement is uh, it's unbelievable. W what, what do you do when, like, explained uh, why the Paul uh, Janssen Award looks like the way it looks like? That w at what point did you know... Wow, how was, can you remember that moment, that Eureka moment? In, in relation to our, what we were working on? Um, yeah, the, I think there was a moment where uh, a mutant that we'd been studying, that Ulrich and we had observed to be apparently unable to fold mitochondrial proteins, was connected by sequencing to the notion that other people had observed that that gene uh, actually encodes a double ring assembly. And we thought, wow, this looks pretty promising that this is some sort of a machine. So that was kind of a aha. And, and then what does a scientist do when you make a world shocking discovery? Do you like ask a, bottle, a, of, a bottle of champagne? Oh, oh or? of course. But you ask a million <laughs> new questions <laughs> yeah. while you're drinking the first glass. <laughs> yeah, that's that what I think for. Yeah. Every new insight gives another new question or many more new questions. Uh -huh. I, we had a, a similar experience when, when we took this system apart and uh, tried to reproduce it in the test tube. And we took a protein that couldn't fold on its own. But in the presence of this chaperone protein, it suddenly worked. This was an amazing moment. And that's really like one specific yeah. moment yeah. that you will probably always yeah. remember. Yes. But it's kind of the joy of tinkering every day in your genes or whatever, not necessarily fully dressed. Um, that's part of it also. Mm -hmm. And I, I think some of the pictures of Dr. Paul actually right in front of a, a chemistry bench where, you know, for all we know, he was actually tinkering that day mm -hmm. is, is really inspiring. I mean, he was, apparently was pretty hands-on. Yeah, that's what I hear and read everywhere as well. But don't you ever get discouraged when you think there must be something there and I'm just not getting there. Mm -hmm. Where did you keep no. the energy and the motivation getting from? Well, I think that's usually late in the day and it's time <laughs> to go home <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and sleep it away. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Come back the next day refreshed. That's true. But science can be very challenging, but then there's this excitement that uh, compensates you for it. And once you have made a discovery, then you know that it can happen again and you are looking forward to that moment. Do you think you will make another one in your lifetime? Are you working on uh, new it's discoveries? It's hard to say. I mean, we, we always work on new discoveries, but perhaps not of this magnitude. Uh, small discoveries can be very nice, too. <laughs> yeah. Well, you never know. 
What, what can we expect from the both of you? Will we be seeing each other again here in two years' time for another discovery? Uh, I, I, I don't I think, think so. It, I think in a lifetime, this is really, we, we've been unbelievably yeah. lucky so many times. But um, we're actively working on uh, Lou Gehrig's disease, ALS, and um, mm -hmm. trying to more or less fix a, an animal model. And I think, for me, that's the, the last best hope for another real aha is maybe to see that we really have fixed something like that. Mm -hmm. So we're trying. I think also the importance of an award like this uh, Dr. Paul Janssen Award, is to get the word of science out there. Because mostly yeah. you work in a lab, and people don't know what you're working on. And it's so important. So what can we do to help you to get the word of science out, what you're working on? I think exactly you're doing what a lot you're already. doing right now. Yeah. yeah. So then I suggest you buy already another suit for the Nobel Prize <laughs> that you m maybe also will win. It happened to three of the other uh, award winners. Oh, we don't know about that. <laughs> we are happy about the Janssen Award. Very. <laughs> Very. That's, that's good. <laughs> yeah. So maybe one final question. Um, what are your hopes for the future, in general, for science and for your discovery? What do you hope to I live to see? I certainly hope that it will be useful for developing treatments. And uh, we may not be the ones who develop those, but that it helps others to do that. Yeah. That's the principle mm -hmm. of science. Mm -hmm. And for you? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that it, it shouts out also that basic discovery is, you know, should be pursued. We still don't know a lot of things about the cell. I mean. I think a lot of people never expected something like this. Um, and, you know, all these years later, I think there are lots of other aspects of the basic workings of the cell, maybe particularly the nervous system, mm -hmm. that would be really helpful to understand so that we can jump to the next legion of really great therapies. Mm -hmm. So stay curious. We Absolutely. have to stay curious That's and try right. to encourage Absolutely. the new generation. Yeah. Absolutely. Let's finalize on this one, but maybe, doctors, you probably know, but maybe not everybody in the audience or watching us online knows, how do they choose you? How do you two <laughs> get to be the <laughs> award winners of this year? So we thought it a very good idea, and he has been uh, announced and welcomed before by Mrs. Kumar, to uh, ask somebody who is in the selection committee um, on stage and explain us a little more on how it all works. I would like to welcome and ask with me on the stage Dr. Cato T. Lorenzen, the eighth designated professor of University of Connecticut. Dr. Lorenzen. Good evening. Good evening. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, first, I want to take the opportunity to uh, provide my personal regards to the family of Dr. Janssen. Uh, he, um, what a tremendous scientist, clinician, um, and humanist, and this is a great way to honor him, and it's wonderful to see you all here. Um, second, I, I was asked to, to talk about how we select the, um, the winner, the winners of the, of the prize. And the process is complex and it's simple. It's complex because we receive a, a large number of nominations each year, and all of them are good. Um, all of them are, you know, all re represent individuals who have made really uh, important contributions in science and medicine. So, um, so it's complex in that way. On the other hand, it's simple because we start by thinking about the award. The award is really an honor of Dr. Paul Janssen. And so we think, we think about Paul Janssen, think about what he stood for um, uh, and uh, the meaning of the award. And so uh, Dr. Janssen was someone who was an inspirational figure, who did inspirational work. So we think about that and moving forward. Uh, Dr. Janssen was an individual who really epitomized innovation um, and also epitomized risk-taking in his work. So we think about that. But the bottom line is that one can be inspirational and one can have, be innovative, but you have to achieve. You have to actually have a result. And, um, and that achievement should have some relationship to being able to help people. 
because Dr. Janssen was someone who um, really was concerned with the lives of people. He had an urgency in terms of creating new technologies, new medications to be able to help people. So um, with that in mind, the committee thinks about the individuals that are there. It's a long process. We get a set of applications and we go through them, and then we then we go through in iterations, but the applications really don't say the, say the whole story. So we go back, we go in depth, we, um, we read primary literature and primary papers, we look at the history and come to a conclusion. Um, and everyone had, comes from a different background. I'm a surgeon, I'm an engineer, uh, others are maybe biologists, but we still use the scientific method in terms of being able to come to conclusions. Um, in, in the case of Ulrich and Art, um, just, I could just say this personally, um, I, w I remember back in medical school, I went to medical school in the 1900s, and, <laughs> and I remember my professors at the Harvard Medical School um, telling me about protein folding and how it occurs spontaneously without any additional help, Hydro hydrophobic, hydrophilic interactions taking place and, and that help guide it. We would shake our heads and because our professors at Harvard would tell us that. Um, and then um, remembering afterwards that there were some discussions about maybe a different way this, this may be happening. And um, some new data that talked about that. So that was in the back of my mind in terms of uh, the application that was there. Um, and then being able to revisit the the, uh, this, uh, this nomination and look at the vast amount of work that's taken place from the time in which the first contention, the first theories were brought about to the point in which the, these theories were proven is really remarkable. And so it's more than just a theory, it's more than just an innovative uh, area, it's an achievement that is really something that, um, that can stand the test of time. And so that's what made this uh, so exciting. Um, and again, reflecting back on, on Dr. Janssen, um, he is an individual who also epitomized the concept of convergence, the bringing together of technologies and insights that are disparate in order to be able to solve problems. And um, this technology, this, 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 so this work by this pair really epitomizes convergence, bringing in areas of genetics, biology, chemistry, physics, neurology to be able to, to address an issue and solve a problem. Um, and again, with Dr. Janssen, he was very concerned about the human condition and where the science, he was, he was dedicated to science, but also dedicated to having answers that will affect people. And clearly this technology has now moved into the realm of being able to provide really uh, breakthrough achievements in terms of the clinical condition. So um, uh, the committee, on behalf of the committee, we are really proud to see this pair win the award. They're so well-deserving, and um, it's an honor for me to be able to congratulate both of you. Thank, Thank you, you so, so much. much. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Laurentin, please, you can take a seat. Gentlemen, we have been keeping you waiting the whole celebration long to get your award. What do you say? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I will not give it to you, but I'm very proud and honored to ask Mrs. Dora Janssen and Dr. Paul Stoffels to join me on stage. And you have the honor of presenting the award to our 2019 award winners. Thank you so much. of the whole Janssen community, the whole j, j community, thank you very, very much for being here and congratulations with this exceptional award. You said at the end, um, that would be the question Dr. Paul would have asked you. 
how fast can you translate this into an animal model so that we can start working with this? <laughs> and, uh, and that is then for the next stage. So thank you the, of thinking like that because it will really help us to get to the next stage with this science. So congratulations again on behalf of all of us in the room and the whole Janssen community. May I ask Mr. Sumar, yeah. Dr. Yeah. Dr. Laurentin, to join us on stage for a photo moment. Dr. Stoffels, if you would please, are you, uh, uh, yes, okay. Dr. Laurentin, Mrs. Kumar, please join us on stage. Hello. And they will absolutely get this one too. No worries. <laughs> so we can all breathe again. <laughs> Except our two award winners, who I will ask to stay on stage. Everybody else can please take a seat again. Gentlemen, um, I think it's about time we give you the time and honor to say a few words. And I don't know which one of you wants to begin. I'll go first. Okay, Dr. Horwitz, please be my guest. Well, it's such a pleasure to be here. I'm greatly honored and humbled to be receiving the 2019 Paul Janssen Award for Biomedical Research together with my collaborator, Professor Earl Richardel. I've known about the work of Dr. Paul since my time in medical school uh, in the early to mid 70s. In pharmacology, his compounds were already textbook material in my, I just pulled it out the other day, uh, Goodman and Gilman, fourth edition, uh, pharmacology, uh, 1970, including already uh, low modal diphenoxylate, uh, the antipsychotic haloperidol, haldol, and the mainstay opioid of anesthesia, fentanyl. I mean, I've never been in an OR where fentanyl wasn't used. Uh, and I met these compounds firsthand during my clinical training probably seven or eight different compounds of Dr. Paul's that I already uh, used as a medical student. Dr. Paul had, a, a, I think, a singular genius for relating what he knew from medicine, the physiology of patients, uh, and chemistry, being able to think down to the level of organic small molecules, uh, and being able to think about how he would modify them to modify physiology uh, we heard earlier in the day about how he um, looked at um, bicyclists and, and their amphetamine usage and was able to derive a compound immediately to, well, I, th I think that actually became the seeds of Haldol. Um, this, uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Sir James Black of um, beta blocker development, I wrote something that I really enjoyed reading. He described how Dr. Paul uh, saw meperidine identified earlier as a compound, uh, as a piperidine derivative uh, that had two actions, a strong antispasmodic effect, but also a strong and addictive analgesic effect. And he could already see it, the piperidine chemistry as a starting point to modify that particular compound to make it either more antispasmodic as he did in loperidol, uh, <laughs> anti-diarrheal diarrheal that's certainly in my medicine chest and probably in that of everybody who's doing a lot of traveling, uh, and the um, opiate uh, derivative fentanyl, which is just used ubiquitously in ORs everywhere in the world today. Um, the patients were waiting, as he said, and millions of them are ever so thankful for these and others of his developments. So in our own work, um, a genetic search through Baker's yeast mutants was the starting point for us. Um, my student Ming Chang and I asked a question uh, whether the cell might need molecular machines to assist proteins to reach the uh, folded active native state. And to our surprise, we found evidence that there, there might be such a thing among a collection of mutants, that uh, in, mitochondrial import mutants that we were studying. And we were very lucky. Just at that time, we were uh, we received a, a phone call from Ulrich and from Walter Neubert, who wondered if they might be of some help to us in analyzing some of our mutants. 
Uh, they did not know at that moment that our tiny lab profoundly needed uh, their help to go forward. And what a delight to have that collaboration, uh, the shared understanding of uh, big questions and how to experimentally address them, their boundless understanding of mitochondria and skills in mitochondrial biochemistry, and their companionship. Uh, Walter, who recently passed away, really became a father figure, energizing but also gently advising and guiding his excited brood, Ulrich and Art, and our teams. Um, it supercharged a three-year period of absolute electrical intensity as we progressed on dissecting the physiology of these ring machines in cells in organello and with isolated components, then moving more generally to understanding in vivo folding pathways as Ulrich did, and to beginning to describe the magic of these double ring machines in biochemical terms as we both did. I'm deeply grateful to many people. Uh, my mentors, Mike Check at Brown, now um, a director at UMass Med uh, Research, who awakened my love for design, execution, and analysis of experiments. Uh, Tony Hunter and Walter Eckhart, who taught me molecular biology. I watched Tony discover tyrosine phosphorylation. That was a really exciting moment. Leon Rosenberg, who taught me human genetics and how to organize and express ideas. Paul Sigler, with whom I collaborated for 10 years on X-ray crystallographic study of the machine, who taught me crystallography and was like a father figure to me. Helen Sable, our peripatetic EM collaborator, providing amazing images of various reaction intermediates in the chaperone and reaction cycle. And Kurt Wutrich, who provided incredible NMR spectra of the gigantic Groyal complexes, gigantic for NMR type of acquisition, and he did it. And I'm grateful to my team of wonderful trainees and additional collaborators. I could mention just a few. Ming Chang, of course, who was one of my first students who came to Yale as a young physician from Taiwan wanting to um, explore fundamental genetics. Kirsten Bragg, a visiting student from Berlin, originally scheduled to visit for a year, but she stayed for four, particularly after she crystallized Groel. Spishek Otwanowski, a remarkable crystallographer in Paul's group, the producer of all the data reduction software that the entire X-ray community uses, who solved the structure of Groel once we got him a heavy atom derivative in a single day. Jonathan Weissman and Hayes Rye, who worked out topology of the machine and its ligands and their arrival and departure. And more recently, Adriana Petri, a terrific biochemist, now a member of the Janssen team here in Europe. Uh, and mixed into all of the discoveries, supporting all of them on a steady basis, my senior team members, Wayne Fenton, George Farr, Christina Furtak, who've been a wellspring, wellspring of thought and action in all of the work. We've logged almost 90 years together, uh, and I'm grateful to my family, my parents who were ever supportive of my almost crazed interest in science as a kid, and my own kids who have tolerated my involvements in experiments, reading, writing, travel, but who have also taught me to uh, put it all down for a while, ski, fish with them, throw the trouts back, how to handle uh, um, the inevitable defeat by them on the tennis court as they've gotten better and better over the years. Uh, and finally, Martina, my wife, the love of my life, uh, who's uh, just been supportive throughout. It's been a, a huge amount of fun, and I've, I want to thank you all for making it really very special for me today. Thank you. Let me also express what an enormous privilege it is to win this award in the name of Paul Janssen, to honor Paul Janssen, and I'm delighted to share this recognition with my collaborator, Art Horvich. I'm really grateful to the award community, uh, committee for recognizing the advancements our field has made in understanding the machinery of protein folding and also the potential that these insights have for developing new treatments of diseases such as Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease. Art has already summarized beautifully the major achievements of Paul Janssen 
clearly he has been a major inspiration to so many of us. In fact, I read somewhere that in Belgium he's more famous than Eddie Merckx. He's <laughs> the famous Tour de France bicyclist. I'd also like to thank many students and postdocs I've had the pleasure of working with over the years, mostly my wife and partner in science manage it. I would have to say that while we have made important discoveries, I think my most important discovery was to find her. <laughs> I've also been very lucky to have wonderful mentors. Art already mentioned Walter Neupert, passed away a few weeks ago. Walter was the person who brought us together and uh, very generously encouraged our collaboration and supported it. Grateful to my wonderful parents. They always encouraged me to follow my dreams. Fortunately, they can no longer see how it worked out. And finally, let me thank all of you for being here tonight to celebrate with us. It has been a fantastic day. The evening is not yet over, and I hope we have a lot more enjoyment. Thank you very much. Thank you, doctors, and again, congratulations. Please take thank a you. seat, and thank you for those beautiful words, not only on science, but also on love. My heart melted, and I, <laughs> I, I felt it all around the room. It's so beautiful. <laughs> and um, we spoke about the language of music before. I suggest that we end the celebration also with the language of music. And we heard like a tiny bit of my old piano, as an ode to Dr. Paul, who also was a piano player. So I suggest we end with my old piano. Adelia, please. If you're welcome, Nikhil on the piano. Well, it is a celebration. So I would like to ask everybody to stand up, if it's possible. And we will clap together, because it's only the two of us. And it's a celebration. Congratulations again. Every life of my body and still retains the air of dignity. His royal venerable style extends a narrow people. 80 80 keeps smiles, keeps so pleasant to see. I said, Love is cold. Oh, my old piano. Tips you in so gracefully when you're involved in a baby grand affair. I said, Love is called my old piano. I have a ball with my old piano. Come on, we can give it up. Every life of my party and still retains the love of dignity. 
his international style that's kills an air of royalty his 80 80 key smile is so pleasant to see love is called my old piano i have a ball with my old piano for the last time <laughs> Love is called and then I want you to sing my Ooh. have a ball with Yes, I'll just stick it one more time. <laughs> Love is called with Thank you, Rezilia. Thank you, Michiel. I thought you were going to dance with me. <laughs> Thank you, our two award winners. Thank you, all the Janssen family. Thank you, all the Johnson and Johnson family from the U.S. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for being present here with us tonight. We are very honored that you are all here. Thank you to all our spectators worldwide, online through Facebook and uh, YouTube. We are going to have a little celebration. Instead of the ceremony, let's celebrate. And I suggest you all do the same. Thank you very much.